got uh, into a bit of a wrangle yesterday over what uh, Dawkins might have meant when he entitled his book The Selfish Gene. Um, okay, um, maybe I had a hucksterist title to my video and I strawmanned him a bit, but I demand the same poetic license that a lot of people are bestowing upon uh, the good Mr. Dawkins. Oh, it was just a title for his book to catch people's attention. Selfish Gene, it sounds pretty cool, eh? Yeah, but it's misleading. It doesn't really say what uh, one would assume it says by looking at the title on the book stand. But, you know, let's look at the real world here. Mr. Dawkins wants money. So, if a catchy title helps him sell his book, even though it's kind of misleading, that's fine. So, okay, I'm guilty of the same thing. Mea culpa. Um, <clears throat> hucksterism in the title of both of our works. Uh, but, in a sense, though, um, I'm not going to back down. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you, uh, anyone who knows me knows that I'm one of the world's most irritatingly stubborn people. Um, I do still think that there is a huge amount of misconception out there concerning evolution and you know, natural selection. Another misnomer, if you ask me. Um, as though evolution is going from bad to good, or, uh, you know, I, I remember that old anecdote about, uh, who was it that said that? Bertrand Russell or somebody, some person known for their wit said that the end result of evolution could be the flu virus fighting over, fighting it out with the gonorrhea bacillus or something like this at the end of time. Those are the last two things alive. Uh, evolution isn't guaranteed to produce anything of any value. <laughs> it's just uh, something that happens, or it isn't even something that happens. It's a descriptive that we place on what has already happened, and we can use that to somewhat map what is possibly or probably going to happen. That's not the same thing as an actual process out there called uh, evolution taking place. Um, I do believe that a lot of people make that error, and I think that the error is so common um, that I'm not really sure that most people who uh, have looked into the idea of the origin of our species, even speciesness is a construct, but really understand what evolution is implying, the whole theory of evolution. Um, it's just describing what has happened. Uh, as I say, um, the stalagmite example. Uh, stalagmites are formed by the endless dripping of water. It doesn't mean that water drips in order to form stalagmites. It, you know, I think that we, we, we understand that, but you turn on any popular nature show and it'll say, say this wonderful survival creature, survivalist, survival creature or whatever, this creature that's able to, <laughs> able to survive. I really have to drink more of this. Creature that is able to survive in its environment has developed these wonderful uh, techniques to allow it to survive in this harsh environment. You know, an uh, example in Canada would be the polar bear. You know, it's fat uh, to keep it warm underwater when it's you know, the water's freezing. Uh, you know, storage of food, all this kind of thing. It, <laughs> nothing of the sort has happened. Evolution has not given this polar bear anything. Um, and it didn't, the polar bear didn't evolve in, in order to shape itself to its environment. Uh, or, I shouldn't say that, in, in a sense one could say that, but um, it didn't evolve certain things in order to survive. It just survived because um, it's forebears, its immediate genetic forebears, i.e. its parents and grandparents, had attributes that allowed it to, which they then passed on. That's not the same thing. Cause and effect are not the same thing. you really got to make sure that you're on the right end of the causal chain. Specifically, I was referring to love. The cynics and the wags say, oh, love, what's that? 
pure biological thing that we've created a huge mystique around and it's all just rubbish. I'm not saying everybody here is saying that. Um, quite the opposite, actually. But what I am saying is there's a big difference between deliberately cultivated and um, worked at love. The, uh, the sort of thing that, you know, you would have discussed with Plato or Socrates over many bowls of wine at a symposium in ancient Athens versus the rather mundane thing that most of us are involved in in our day-to-day -day lives, um, where it does seem to be just some sort of role that we fall into as members of society. Um, we are expected to reproduce. We are expected, it's assumed, that we're going to couple up with another human being, generally of the opposite gender, but not necessarily. And <clears throat> this, in turn, is a, a ritualization or a um, standardization, or whatever you want to call it, of, an, of a basic biological drive whose ultimate aim is the preservation and promotion of our DNA, the selfish gene. No. Um, that is an explanation. I'm not convinced by it, but it seems that a lot of people are convinced by this, where evolution seems to have taken on a sort of a life of its own as an actual process out there, as something of a god, something of a first principle in reality that is causing things to evolve. No, I, I you know... I, I don't see any evidence for that at all, genetically or otherwise. Uh, the gene isn't selfish. Yes, I understand that, atheistic will. Uh, and uh, I appreciate you pointing that out to me yesterday. But, again, I'm not going to fundamentally back down on the idea that I believe that um, natural selection and evolution and heritability and all that kind of thing have been and continue to be badly misrepresented, not necessarily maliciously, and badly misunderstood. Um, it goes back to my old uh, thing about the Etruscans versus the Romans by Seneca. Um, Seneca said, we Romans, being of a practical uh, turn of mind, say that lightning is caused by the collision of clouds. The Etruscans, on the other hand, say that clouds collide in order create lightning. Um, I'm a bit of a Roman in this regard, and um, I think that that kind of places me out of step with an awful lot of people regard with regards to natural selection and, and evolution. I do not place deliberately cultivated and tended and promoted love um, in the same category as a blind drive to reproduce. I think that they can intersect with each other, but I don't think they are necessarily the same thing. Um, again, I'm not saying that this is accessible or even of interest to the herd, if you want to, you know, it, some people might find that a hateful term that I use, the herd. Um, maybe it is a rare thing. Maybe it is a rare person who takes control of love and makes it into something that he or she wants it to be, as opposed to something that seems to just sort of happen and come naturally as part of being a human. Um, cultivated love, promoted love, celebrated love, idealized love, or love that is worked at every single day as opposed to just something nice and comfortable in our lives, that is not the same thing um, as a base biological drive. And anyone who's going to tell me that it is is going to have to prove their case. Um, I don't think so. I think there is such a thing as putting your own initiative, your own stamp onto your own existence and the, your experiences. Experiences come in, but they can be altered from within. Um, the information stream is coming in, my desires and my um, interpretations and my manipulations of my experiences go out and they meet together in what we call the present. Um, and I don't think that we are simply puppets of anything. Um, 
we can be if we just sort of let ourselves drift into things. And in many ways, there are many philosophies out there that tell us to do that. Stoicism seems to be one. Just accept your lot in life and go with it. Um, avoid the passions. Some people think that way. Other people say, you can inject meaning into everything that you do. The most base, um, below the equator type desire, if you want to call sex that, you can turn into something sublime. Um, you can inject your own meaning, your own romance, your own value, your own heroicism into all this. You can turn a rather mundane thing into something huge, um, something big that is very big and very profound and very meaningful, even if only from your own perspective, but ultimately that's the only perspective we have is our own. Um, is that egoism? Maybe. But maybe that that's a, a species of egoism that is inevitable, um, given our multiple points of view as human beings. My point of view, whether I want it to be or not, and this isn't a moral statement, is always going to be more important than anybody else's. Why? Because I can see through it. I can actually experience my own point of view. I can attempt to experience other people's, but I can't ultimately experience what they're experiencing. So all that I have, all the profundity, all the meaning, all the whatever you want to call it, all the true value out of life is something that I'm more or less experiencing by myself or maybe with a very small group of other people that I can share on a day-to-day -day basis my intimate experiences in as much as such a thing is possible. That creates a hierarchy of people who are important to me in my own mind. If that's egoistic, well, that's just how it goes, doesn't it? You know, it's you look after your own or you're interested in your own because they happen to be in your field of vision and you only have a certain amount of empathy to go around so you can only empathize with people that you have enough information on to empathize with um, that sounds kind of mean doesn't it what that means is that you know I'm more worried about my own kid when he goes with it his bottle for an extra two minutes than I am about two million starving kids in Africa well, is that a human limitation? Am I a bad person because of that? Or, or is that just the way the humans are put together and I'm just admitting it? Um, you know, should I feel just as big about the love affair that somebody, uh, you know, in another part of the world is having as I do feel about mine? Maybe. Can I do that? I don't think that's a realistic expectation. And I don't think that it's, e equally, I don't think that it's realistic to, to sort of drop both down to the lowest common denominator, i.e., what do these two things have in common, my love affair and somebody else's love affair? Well, they're both biological and it's a reproduction thing and that's the end of it. Um, lowest common denominator, yes. Remember, though, sauce for the herd isn't sauce for the non-herd. Um, elitist, perhaps, but again is elitism of some species inevitable given that we do have multiple points of view 